In this video, I want to look at a recently published medical paper that's been peer-reviewed. Its title goes straight to the heart of the matter. Why are we vaccinating children against COVID-19? It was published on the 14th of September this year in the scientific journal Toxicology Reports. It's a good paper and worth reading in full, but here I just want to pick out a few notable sentences. The paper sets the scene by highlighting how healthy children are at extremely low risk of death due to COVID. It states, the bulk of the official COVID-19 attributed deaths per capita occur in the elderly with high comorbidities, and the COVID-19 attributed deaths per capita are negligible in children. Therefore, with that in mind, any vaccine would need to be extremely safe if mass rollout to children is considered. But how safe is it in children? The authors state, the clinical trials did not address long-term effects that, if serious, would be borne by children and adolescents for potentially decades. It's quite a long paper, so in the interest of time, I will skip through to the section titled Potential Short, Mid and Long-Term Risks of Mass COVID-19 Inoculation for Children. Children are unique relative to COVID-19. They have negligible risks of serious effects from the disease. Yet for the COVID vaccine, mid or long-term adverse effects are unknown. Any mid or long-term adverse effects that emerge could impact children adversely for decades. They then list some theoretical mechanisms of harm which the COVID vaccine could potentially cause, such as the spike protein itself can be a toxin or a pathogenic protein. Many researchers such as Dr. Bridal and Dr. McCullough have raised concerns as to the fact that the spike protein itself can be harmful. Both the spike protein from natural infection, as well as the spike protein that's generated in the body by the COVID vaccine. This toxic effect of the spike protein has been well documented in the scientific literature. For example, in this paper that was published in the medical journal, Vaccines. SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, implications for possible consequences of COVID-19 vaccines. This paper was published in January earlier this year. Vaccines is a peer-reviewed medical journal affiliated with the American Society for Virology. The paper states, recent observations suggest that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein can by itself trigger cell signaling that can lead to various biological processes. It is reasonable to assume that such events, in some cases, result in the pathogenesis of certain diseases. Back to the toxicology report paper. So that's the first potential mechanism of harm stated by the authors. The second is, the spike protein can damage vascular endothelial cells. These are cells which line blood vessels, which if damaged can cause blood clots. This has also been well documented in the scientific literature, both from natural infection as well as from the COVID vaccine. Now in the interest of time, I won't go through each of these. So skip into the last one, number 16, the Pfizer study performed in Japan. This was a biodistribution study. It found that the Pfizer vaccine injected into the deltoid muscle became widely distributed throughout the body, accumulating in organs such as the adrenal glands, liver, spleen, bone marrow and ovaries. It is unknown whether accumulation in these organs causes damage and it might not be clearly evident until years after vaccination. The authors raised specific concerns regarding distribution to the ovaries and the potential effect it could have on fertility. They warn, adverse effects on the ovaries could be potentially catastrophic for women of childbearing or pre-childbearing age. The British Medical Journal has also raised concerns about the biodistribution of the vaccine-induced spike protein in an article published on the 8th of June this year titled, Why We Petitioned the FDA to Refrain from Fully Approving Any COVID-19 Vaccine This Year. It was co-authored by Peter Doshi, who is a senior editor at the BMJ. It states, We also call on the FDA to require a more thorough assessment of spike proteins produced in situ by the body following vaccination, including studies on their full biodistribution, pharmacokinetics and tissue-specific toxicities. This paper was a few months ago, and the FDA, to my knowledge, has still not supplied this information. So back to the toxicology report paper. What are the potential mid and long-term adverse health effects from the COVID-19 inoculation on children specifically, taking into account that they will be exposed 
not only to the spike protein component of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but also to the toxic LMP encapsulating shell. LMP stands for lipid nanoparticles, which are essentially delivery vehicles that protect the mRNA and transport it into cells. This toxic combination will have bypassed many defense safeguards typically provided by the innate immune system through direct injection. So in natural infection, SARS-CoV-2 primarily infects the mucosal surfaces in the upper respiratory tract. This activates the mucosal immune response, which is a defensive safeguard, and that's bypassed by the vaccine. Mucosal immunity is accepted science. It is an important first line of defense to a respiratory pathogen, and SARS-CoV-2 is no exception to this, as outlined in this peer-reviewed paper published in November 2020 by Frontiers in Immunology, titled Mucosal Immunity in COVID-19, a Neglected but Critical Aspect of SARS-CoV-2 Infection. This paper discusses IgA antibodies and other mechanisms of the mucosal immune response. Due to time limitations, I'll just highlight one key sentence. We contend that mucosal immunity has a major part to play in COVID-19 at several levels. But of course, the COVID vaccine bypasses this mucosal immunity. Is this potentially problematic? The authors of the toxicology report argue that it is. They write, as we have shown, the main reasons why we believe the spike protein could be harmful to children, even though they don't seem to get sick from exposure to SARS-CoV-2 are, one, the bypassing of the innate immune system by inoculation. As we've discussed, the COVID vaccine bypasses the important mucosal immunity. Two, the larger volume of spike protein that enters the bloodstream. The vaccine delivers a genetic code into your cells, instructing them to produce the spike protein. It's quite possible that significantly more spike protein is produced this way, compared to the amount that the body would encounter from natural infection. And three, the additional toxic effects of the encapsulating LMP layer, the lipid nanoparticle, which is, of course is not a component of natural infection. In the interest of time, I'll scroll down towards the end of the chapter. For children, the chances of death from COVID-19 are negligible, but the chances of serious damage over their lifetime from the toxic inoculations are not negligible. What is the rush for a group at essentially zero risks? Given that the inoculations were tested only for a few months, only very short-term adverse effects could be obtained. A number of researchers have suggested the possibility of severe longer-term autoimmune antibody-dependent enhancement, neurological and other potentially serious effects, with lag periods ranging from months to years. Now this paper is not arguing against the COVID vaccine per se, certainly not for the elderly and clinically vulnerable. Instead, it's looking at the risk-benefit ratio for children. The paper proposes that healthy children do not get health benefits from the COVID vaccine because they are at such a small risk of severe disease. Yet there is potential for adverse effects from the COVID vaccine through different mechanisms as outlined in the paper. These risks are unknown and may not become evident in the short or mid-term. In summary, this paper adds much weight to the argument that for healthy children, the COVID vaccine offers only risk with no direct health benefits. 